Welcome back, everyone. Um, I think we're, we'd all agree this morning's session thus far was, was really quite um, informative. It allowed us to dig a bit deeper in terms of uh, our subject matter and particularly building on the lecture from the Chancellor last night. So now we get to sort of go even, even further by uh, sharing some insights from some experts uh, sitting around me in their various different fields to look at the question of what role can and do multilateral organisations play in effectively addressing modern slavery. So to do that, I am going to introduce our, our panellists sitting next to me and moderate this session. But firstly, I'd like to introduce Her Excellency the High Commissioner uh, uh, Vicky Treadle, CMG VMO, the, the uh, UK High Commissioner. Uh, the High Commissioner took up her appointment to Australia on the 13th of March in 2019. And as High Commissioner, she is the UK government's representative in, a Commonwealth, in the Commonwealth nation and works to advance and maintain the relationship between the UK and Australia. High Commissioner has held senior roles in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office since she began her Foreign Service career in 1979. Most recently, she served as the British High Commissioner to Malaysia and New Zealand and Deputy High Commissioner to India. And additionally, Her Excellency was Director of UK Trade and Investment for the North West of England from 2002 to 2005, where she was responsible for driving trade and investment as a key pillar of regional and economic development. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce Professor Justine Nolan, who's a professor of, at UNSW Law and the director of the Australian Human Rights Institute. Her latest book, Addressing Modern Slavery, published in 2019, co-authored by M. Boersma, examines how consumers, government and business are both part of the problem and the solution in curbing modern slavery in global supply chains. She advises companies, NGOs and governments on these issues and is a member of the Australian Government's Expert Advisory Group on Modern Slavery. Justine has practice as a private sector and international human rights lawyer. She is a member of the editorial board of the Business and Human Rights Journal and is a visiting scholar at NYU Stern Centre for Business and Human Rights. Welcome, Justine. Can I also uh, welcome Padma Rahman, who is Chief Executive of the Australian Human Rights Commission and came to that position after establishing the Victorian Law Reform Commission, which he ran for nine years. During that time, Ms Rahman was also a member of the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, and she was instrumental in assisting the Victorian Government develop and implement the Victoria Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act 2006. In 2018, Ms. Rahman was awarded the Public Service Medal, which recognises outstanding service <coughs> by employees in the federal, state and territory and local governments. Ms. Rahman sits on a number of boards, including the Human Rights Law Centre and the Governance and Advisory Board for the Australian National Contact Point under the OECD guide, Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises. Welcome, Padma. And finally, Sally Irwin. Sally moved, uh, when Sally moved from Germany in 2008, she was confronted with the issue of human trafficking in Eastern Europe and established a charity in Berlin to fund organisations that supported the victims. She became very active in a centre supporting women trafficked into pr prostitution and was personally involved in helping a number of these women return to their country and begin a new life. After four years working on the ground, Sally returned to Sydney, keen to apply her experience here in Australia. And in March 2014, Sally founded the Freedom Hub Survivor School that rebuilds the lives of victims, provides long-term support and a peer support program. Their trauma-informed classes train, equip and provide work experience to survivors of modern slavery in Australia. In 2016, she opened a Business for Purpose which now consists of two cafes, an event venue and an ethical online retail shop to fund the administration of the Survivor School. Sally was awarded one of Australia's top 50 business leaders by Inside Small Business in 2018 
and Sally has been an active advocate to end slavery and help victims by sitting on a number of advisory boards and networks, and the Freedom Hub itself is also a member of the Commonwealth 8.7 network. So please make all our panellists welcome. So to address this question, I'd like to start with Her Excellency. Your Excellency, the UK uh, Prime Minister has been the chair in office of CHOGOM, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting since 2018. What sort of role has the Commonwealth played in recent years in addressing modern slavery? And how can it be strengthened as we look forward to the next CHOGOM? Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. I'm delighted to be here. Well, our chair in office began at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in April 2018. And I think we have to take our cue from the communique that was produced as a result of that, because that set the agenda for the two-year period. But it's going to be a bit longer now, as um, the next chogam that was due in Rwanda has been postponed because of the current COVID situation. But the communique had the headline, Towards a Common Future. And there were five key elements to it, a more sustainable future, a fairer future, a more prosperous future. But it was in the segment covering a more secure future that we set out clearly the actions that leaders, the heads of government who attended, agreed action and called for effective measures to eradicate forced labour, end modern slavery and human trafficking, and secure the prohibition and elimination of child labour. So the question is, it's very easy to come up with communique, make those commitments, but how do you translate ambition to action and acts to application of the law? So if I can just sort of, which I think might have been touched on in the session before I arrived, for us to play a leadership role, we must walk the talk. And this goes back to Britain being the first country to establish a Modern Slavery Act in 2015. But in terms of our international work uh, that flowed from that, not just what we do domestically, but that agenda that we wish to lead that translated through to why this was an important element of our, uh, the Chogham that we hosted, um, is to put financial commitment into it. So at the time, we put in £150 million to support our international work. Uh, that has now gone up to £200 million per annum. One of the other things that we do is to publish an annual report on modern slavery that covers what we do domestically at home, because make no mistake, we have this problem and we have this issue uh, domestically, but also what is it we have done internationally, and you're quite right, um, you know, multilateral institutions are fundamental to this, whether it is the work that we do at the United Nations or through organisations like the International Labour Organisation. But coming back to the Commonwealth, uh, what are we as a family of nations going to do it? 53 countries, 2.4 billion people, um, accounting for US dollars 10.4 trillion of global GDP. If between our 53 countries we can't address this issue, where we know there are, I think it's 40 million people we estimate, in some form of forced labour, modern slavery. Um, so surely, as a group of nations, we can. So this is, has been a call to action. We work very closely with partners like Australia, um, other leading members of the Commonwealth, but also countries beyond the Commonwealth. Uh, how we work through the United Nations system, as I said, the ILO and other multilateral institutions. Um, and there is much work that goes on through our engagement uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, to share our experience of developing the legislation, uh, to do the work through our 
law enforcement agencies because ultimately those who traffic and put people into modern slavery or child labor, um, sort of prostitution end of that too, for women in particular, girls, uh, young children, uh, how do we support through, for example, our national crime agency? So across the full spectrum from government to government, from sharing legislation, from putting money into programs, uh, our overseas development program, uh, working uh, through our law enforcement agencies, because the, this, this is an international crime at the end of the day. And it requires political will. And I think it's just about keeping the work going on all of those fronts. Uh, and as we do each year to produce a report, I have the segment here from the 2020 UK annual report on modern slavery. You know, what have we done? What are we achieving? Who are we working with? Um, this is a consequence of setting out not just ambition, but the legislation that supports it, hardwiring into the architecture of our public service, whether it is my organization, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, our home ministry, our law enforcement agencies, that this just becomes mainstreamed about how we address the issue day to day from an operational point of view. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and also for the UK government's leadership in, in this space of modern slavery, which Australia has looked up to um, in its own, its own formulation of policy. I guess that highlights the role of government or governments in terms of the Commonwealth. But what about the role of business? I think this is where I'd like to ask Professor Nolan, who has written a book even on, on um, the, you know, looking at the role of business, of consumers, as well as government. <laughs> But the whole business and human rights movement is incre incredibly important in this puzzle of addressing and eliminating modern slavery. It can't just be government uh, alone. So, Professor Nolan, what do you see as some of the multilateral efforts that have been put in place that have been most effective for progressing the sort of business human rights movement to end modern slavery? Thank you, Lisa. And if you keep calling me Professor Nolan, I'm going to call you the honorary. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, the honorary. Um, uh, and thank you very much to Joe and ANU for having us here today. It's a really useful discussion, and for, for, to you all for coming. Um, you know, I'm in a fortunate position as an academic, as that I can always speak bluntly and never be, you know, criticised uh, except by the government. Um, so there's a lot of noise around modern slavery. And some of that noise has really been really usefully leveraged. Um, there's increasing awareness. Um, there are really you know, great actions that have been led by the UK and followed by Australia and others. But there is, I would say, sort of this crescendo of noise with a lack of follow through um, on it. And there's particularly a lack of follow through in some ways around what happens if you find it. Um, and what's the role of business and government and how is that funded and how are survivors supported? Um, you know, and it's apparent here today, you know, with Sally's work is that you have a, an individual um, privately funding the support for survivors of modern slavery. And so then I would ask, well, what's the role of government and business there? So government has done a really great job in particularly setting up policies and processes and the Australia and the UK in particular in setting up a new law. Um, and those laws were designed to bring business along. And, and there's been great business support for this in many places around the world. But those laws also don't have an awful lot of teeth, which is why business likes supporting those laws. Um, because laws that really around modern slavery are largely outsourcing regulation to the private sector. So if I said to you, let's have a new tax law and let's let companies self-regulate and perhaps some NGOs might help them sort out if they're going to pay, you'd be like, well, that doesn't seem like a great law. But yet we're OK to do that in relation to modern slavery because there's no sanctions or incentives involved to support. Um, and the business and human rights movement for a long time has focused on self-regulation. And self-regulation is a really important mechanism for regulation because you get the buy-in for business. But you don't always get that follow-through. And I think with the leverage of now of the Australian and the UK government, we're at a point where we realise that there is this massive problem. We've got a lot of business on board. And over the last decade in particular, 
with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, there's an understanding and acceptance that business has responsibilities around human rights and that it's not just sort of someone else's problem or the government's problem. Because you know, more than 25 million people of this 40 million people are working in global supply chains. So they're working for the products that we use um, every day and they're in corporate and government supply chains. And so we have to think about when there's an acceptance by companies in particular in business that there is a problem, then what's their responsibility to follow through and remedy? And there's been massive, I think, um, you know, forward progress in terms of business acceptance around rights. When I started working in this field more than 20 years ago, the discussion with businesses then, like Nike, was like, it's not our problem. You know, go and talk to my supplier in Vietnam, but it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. And see, you've seen a complete 360 with the big brand multinational companies who, whose brand is relevant to these products because no company wants to be associated with slavery. There's not a lot of black and white there in relation to is it a problem or it's not a problem. And we saw that recently with Xinjiang that um, Joe raised. So I think business has a really key role and I think government has a key role to bring business along. But I guess from the outside, I'm sort of at the point where I'm like, enough of the softly, softly. You know, we've got 40 million people. The number of people in slavery has increased in the world since the times of the transatlantic slave trade. And yet we're still sort of saying, we'll get there eventually. Um, and, you know, as I often say, companies are on an endless journey about human rights. Every time you go to a conference, they talk about their journey, which is always very interesting. But the journey never has an end, you know. And they're never on a journey to profit. They, they figure out how to do that very quickly. But the journey to human rights takes a really long time and it's really windy. And I think there's no more urgent journey than freeing someone from slavery. Mm. So I guess my argument is that we need business and we need government, we need civil society, we need people like Sally. We need greater coordination, we need more funding and we need a focus, a harder focus, on how to ensure there's compliance and also how we fund remedy in relation to it. So that's my rant. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Professor. <laughs> thank you, the honorary. Um, well, look, we've, we've looked at... We've looked a little bit at government's role. We've, we've looked a little bit at business's role. Human rights is obviously the connector of all of this, what we're talking about. So what, what's the sort of independent body role? That's where I want to ask Padma in terms of her role at the Australian Human Rights Commission. I know that Padma, the commission is part of a sort of broader network in the Commonwealth yeah. of national human rights institutes. How, how does that network work in terms of, you know, independent oversight, you know, independent sort of uh, voices to government, to business and the like? Thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, there are... Uh, so we're the National Human Rights Institution in Australia. Um, there's a process of accreditation of National Human Rights Institutions which then gives you participation rights in the UN. So we're a status A um, uh, uh, institution, which means we have participation rights. And there's a whole lot of criteria that you have to satisfy to get status A, largely around independence and being able to um, choose what you uh, focus on in, in your country. Um, so there is a network of national human rights institutions, both globally, um, it's called GAMRI, sounds like gangrene, but it's the Global <laughs> Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. It used to be the ICC, but then that was too confusing. People thought it was cricket or the International <laughs> Criminal Court. So um, anyway, so there's a global alliance and then there's a, there's a regional, um, which, which is broken up into regions and we're part of the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions. And then importantly, there's a Commonwealth um, network of um, human rights institutions. And I think human rights institutions can play a really important role in this space because we do often, um, we see ourselves as the bridge between civil society and government. And, uh, a, a very and we're good facilitators of discussion and bringing stakeholders together. And also most of us have a role in terms of advising governments, um, both on legislation and policy. Um, and lots of us have complaint mechanisms. Um, so while we don't have a clear modern slavery um, legislative remit, we do have discrimination laws in Australia, we don't have a Human Rights Act, but we do have ways for human rights complaints to come to us. 
Um, so national human, the Commonwealth Forum of National Human Rights Institutions is a really interesting group because it's the only grouping that shares a common language, um, common legal system, uh, and we can actually exchange uh, really meaningfully what we can do um, across the forum. Uh, modern slavery hasn't yet been uh, a sort of priority of the forum, um, but the forum meets in the, um, uh, in the margins of Chogham and tries to get a statement to Chogham, and there was certainly discussion <laughs> leading up to this uh, Chogham ab about putting modern slavery in there. So it's, it's an interesting forum that can put pressure on, um, on governments and collectively can, can have a voice around this issue. Thank you, Padma. I think um, the, the, the missing part we haven't talked about so far is, is civil society or at least frontline services and, and sort of response and, and support for, for survivors. Uh, Sally, as, as head of a, a frontline organisation of supporting victims, survivors, of modern slavery, are you seeing some of the outcomes of this sort of architecture that we've talked about today through the Commonwealth, uh, business efforts, are you seeing that sort of play out in, in a positive way in terms of, you know, the numbers you're seeing through your organisation or, you know, a change in, in approach? Yeah, I think um, what I'm seeing is more awareness. Um, it's been, you know, seven years, people looked at you with very funny eyes when you suggested that there was slavery happening in Australia. So I think the Modern Slavery Act and, and a lot of the stuff that's going on with the businesses particularly has raised a lot of awareness. Um, remediation is a big issue mm. because they don't know what to do. So I'm getting a lot of phone calls about how we can be the remediation <coughs> for some of the corporates. Um, if they identify slavery within their supply chains in Australia, can we take them? What's our policies on risk? How are we handling their safety and all that sort of stuff? So I'm loving all that. Um, COVID has really um, heightened everything. And I think we all know that with just general life, but even more so with um, victims of slavery. Um, we know our everyday anxiety peaked. Theirs has just gone through the roof. Um, so um, part of my um, managing of how to work with this is I did become part of the 8.7 network with Schnee and her crowd um, so that we could really work out best practice between the Pacific region, how we can best work with survivors and people that are in isolation and being um, into these terrible situations. So um, that's been a big eye-opener for me. That's really helped me transform the way the Freedom Hub is looking at its future for um, working with victims of slavery. I've stepped up and I'm now on the management committee for um, Schnee's um, committee, so representing the Pacific region, we're now at the point where we can, I'm very excited to say that we're at the point now where we can start breaking down into regional groups, how we can on the ground start to do this a lot better by applying all our various knowledge. But I see Australia particularly, we've got the resources, we've got the privilege, we've got, there's plenty of things that we can do to really help our region start to be much more on the ground helping people in the flesh, really, that's the thing. But we nearly doubled our numbers of survivors here in Australia within our school. Um, immediately at the time, of course, I lose all my, my um, funding, which is through my private enterprise of hospitality. So as I'm watching the, the, the events and the weddings and the everything cancelling myself, we were self-funded 60% through our business um, funding our school. Um, so as I'm losing the income, I'm just getting more and more referrals from all over Australia. So it was, it was a very difficult year for us. It's, we're, not, we're not through yet. Um, obviously, hospitality's still got a lot of challenges. Um, but it's been amazing to see how generous people are. And I do think um, one of the silver linings for um, the modern slavery is that when people were at home isolated, more people were on the internet, I think people were really learning a lot about this issue and people were more sensitive to people's anxiety and mental health and we had about probably an 800% increase in donations um, purely because people wanted to see um, the Survivor School survive without our income. So it's, it's been a very interesting year, yeah. Well, Sally, do you think, like you're saying, this massive increase in survivors that have come mm. through your 
organization do you what's that from do you think that's right because there's more awareness or there's there's a pathway now that's that's clearly supported through civil society and government for survivors we have three direct we have three pathways really for referrals into our service um, the majority is still the support for trafficking persons program and I think that increased um, because red the caseworkers couldn't work like we, we're on the phone, <laughs> we're doing face to we, what, our face to face work with survivors had to go online very quickly. We had to teach them on the phone how to use Zoom. We had to buy laptops. We had to get data. We had to get it out there, and so that we could actually meet with them very regularly, very quickly. Um, so that was that was the beginning. But uh, that's harder for a government agency or a pro government program to do, right? We're we're privately funded. We can do pretty much what we like. <laughs> If we're, and so we could just immediately start to, to help. So I think that's why that increased, that pathway. The other pathway that really increased for us is the um, other community services referring to us. Domestic violence often becomes modern slavery once a woman loses her bank account, her passport, everything, and she can't leave the house unsupervised, etc. So domestic violence centres, we got more referrals through them, and also youth, um, young girls who are being forced to marry that don't want to end up on the streets through youth services. So we, so that's the other community services we started to get more calls through. Um, the other referral pathway that we have is what we call our direct pathway, which is when people have heard about the Freedom Hub and they go, oh my gosh, there's some people out there that can help us, and we get the direct call from a survivor or from a friend. And so that pathway did not increase, unfortunately, because we're not out there and it's very people are really locked in and they can't. They can't communicate with us, so that was that's one area that had been growing pre-COVID. It's sort of it's sort of stopped, and it's been the support for traffic persons and that and the um, community services that have brought the increase for us. I think now that COVID is not over, but I know it's we're at a point where we're all back out and we're mixing. Um, we are now getting a lot of phone calls from businesses because they've put their act in, the submissions are in, and they're the big corporates, and they're going, gosh, now what are we going to do? How can we How can we do this? We need staff training. I've trained in the last 18 months over 400 small businesses particularly on how to um, map and prepare their supply chains for the large corporates who are asking them, what are you doing about your slavery and supply chain? Um, so we're doing a lot of training, um, staff training and awareness and identification within businesses. And that, to me, getting back to your last question, is going to be one area of massive raising awareness for the future. As all these, stuff, you can just imagine, even just the government, all the hospitals, or, you know, all being trained on slavery because it's now part of what they've got to do. Um, just Westpac, for example, who I'm very close with, um, just all their stuff. You know, Len Lease. You know, just think about all those people are now going to start being educated about slavery in Australia. That's going to identify more more victims for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do at Freedom Hub. Um, Hi, Commissioner. Obviously, the UK was the first country to introduce a Modern Slavery Act in 2015 and um, has led the way for particularly Australia, but hopefully other, other Commonwealth nations. Uh, Walk Free is working very hard with New Zealand at the moment and hope that New Zealand will be the third uh, country to introduce a Modern Slavery Act. But there's been some other activities in, uh, in other nations, in the EU and the like. Um, how do you think the UK has sort of shaped those sorts of movements and responses um, to, to, to allow that sort of momentum to slowly lift? Well, it is an important foreign policy priority for us. So how we use our influence to encourage, as we did with Australia, to introduce your own Modern Slavery Act. Uh, we will lean in too with the work with New Zealand and indeed other countries, whether within or without the Commonwealth. But having been at the forefront of this agenda, uh, and we wish to remain at the forefront of this, shaping, influencing, providing practical help and advice. Um, we are also learning from our own experience. So we have looked precisely at the point that Justine made. You know, we have a set of principles, there's this issue of self-regulation, corporates and businesses saying, what am I doing to clean up my supply chain? 
but how do we really create the motivation for them? So we have announced a series of measures in the UK to ensure that British companies and public bodies do not profit from forced labour. Uh, we we're planning to legislate to impose financial penalties, because that's where it hurts, uh, for those who do not comply with our modern slavery act, um, the transparency obligations that we require. And there is a broader sort of awareness raising. Uh, often, if you look at global retail trends, uh, you will look at what the British public does. You know, they cottoned on to fair trade before most other major developed economies. So increasingly, our consumers make a moral choice, an ethical choice about what they will buy. And they will say, am I clear about the provenance of this? Has there been child labor? for example. So it creates a virtuous circle in the UK that our average citizen wants to see whichever political party they're voting for being very clear on this agenda. And I think that experience and how we share it in particular with civil society, with NGOs, the work of um, the development arm of my parent organization is really important. Because governments, of course, can shape the landscape in which we all operate. But it is also about carrying public opinion and helping people uh, to make that ethical choice uh, in, in themselves. So a lot of our charities and NGOs who are connected globally as well, uh, it's that marriage between civil society and government in Britain that I think is also a powerful model uh, that we can share. And, and beyond our advocacy and our leadership in constantly <coughs> refining, and I think our <coughs> annual report is an important part of that process, it is looking at, coming back to your question to me about the multilateral organizations. You know, in the UN there are a number of protocols that countries have yet to ratify, which provide safeguards. Uh, protocols on uh, forced labour, forced marriage. We in Britain, too, place a huge emphasis on the work we do for education, and education for girls in particular. It touches on your point um, uh, earlier. You know, we have seen evidence that where we work with governments to ensure that young girls see through their secondary education, some of the child prostitution, some of the forced marriage issues that then end up in modern slavery and human trafficking are uh, minimized. And there is empirical evidence for this. Uh, working with the Indian government uh, to ensure that increasingly girls have access to education and know that that is a human right has seen the rates of child marriage halved in recent years. So there are multiple policy settings and solutions that we need to work on. I think just picking up on the High Commissioner's point about the UK Act uh, now under review and looking at sort of strengthening it through, through you know, penalties or, or the like, Justine, in your sort of sphere in terms of, you know, that these are sort of harder measures, the softer measures, and you talked about self-regulation, obviously a softer measure. Where do you see the sort of business and human rights movement going? Does it need more teeth in terms of um, issues like penalties and the like? Yeah, I think um, I, I think uh, the High Commission is exactly right. And the, the UK moves, I think, will be really important in terms of what um, they're looking at. So the independent review that was run um, the last couple of years basically said the transparency process isn't enough by itself, that we need something more to increase compliance um, around this. And they're looking at a number of measures, as she, as she mentioned. And I think it's important to think about both positive and negative. So it's not all about sanctioning a business um, and imposing penalties. Um, it's also about how you, do you incentivise them to get involved. So it might be saying that you can't have access to a government contract unless you're complying with this law and you've got these procedures in place. But if you don't, then we may impose a fine 
or I think, you know, usefully we might impose a requirement that your directors can't be directors for a certain period of time because these statements are signed off by the directors. Fines are very useful, I think, for companies, but often the fine is still quite disproportionate to their revenue. I think it's a useful step, but once you get to do a director and say you can't be a director for another year, directors then start to take a lot more attention about what the company is doing. So, you know, as she said exactly, there's all different points of leverage. Um, but I also think it's looking at um, not just a modern slavery act, it's looking at coupling with the US of, of takes a different approach where it uses targeted trade bans, um, that our goods are coming into the US made from forced labor, um, then that supplier is targeted. Um, so I think it's looking at two of those mechanisms together, um, and also bringing the Australian-based brand into that, so it's not just a supplier. So there are all these mechanisms. But the business and human rights movement generally is moving um, in, in a direction that is demanding greater accountability. We see that in the EU with their discussion around the mandatory human rights due diligence law. Um, the Fra France and the Netherlands have brought in um, more comprehensive laws uh, more recently around due diligence around supply chains. So, you know, 10 years ago, no one would have thought that they, these were possible. Um, I think they've got a, a long way to go. Um, and the business and human rights movement is really broad. If you think of all the human rights that might be impacted, um, how you deal with that, uh, I think it's moving in the right direction. Um, you know, it can be a snail, but <laughs> the snail's still moving. But, so that's positive progress. Padma, the Australian Human Rights Commission recently published a report on finance services and modern slavery, I think in partnership with KPMG. Yeah. I'm giving the Commission more credit, <laughs> though. Yes. Um, it, you know, if this is a sector, the finance sector, um, that has significant links to modern slavery, but I think due to its size, its complexity, it's often seen as a sort of a remote sector or remote to the issue. How have multilateral initiatives like the Liechtenstein Initiative influenced the finance sector's attention to modern slavery? It's a big question. Um, so yes, we I think I think it's starting to be pretty evident that the finance sector is pivotal in 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 the whole in this whole space. Um, obviously, um, if you think about um, <clears throat> uh, the ways in which it, it affects the finance sector in terms of uh, a vehicle for illicit profit laundering by directly um, procuring goods tainted with modern slavery <clears throat> or indeed a financing projects that use or are linked to modern slavery, the finance sector is really critical. Um, so we produced some guidance uh, along with KPMG and we partnered with them largely because they have the industry connections that we might not, um, and the clients that we, do, we don't have access to. And really the guidance is about um, getting financial services actors to think of uh, the risks to people, so putting people at the centre rather than business risks at, at the centre. Um, it's been hugely successful in terms of its take up. There's, there's really strong appetite for guidance in this space. We've done one, a, a previous one on construction and um, property industry, but it feels like the finance sector is, is, is really, really hungry for this information. Um, in terms of the Lichtenstein um, uh, initiative, um, it's, it's a really interesting initiative. It's, uh, it's for finance against slavery and trafficking, or FAST. Um, so the foreign ministers of Liechtenstein, Australia and the Netherlands, as well as Nobel laureate and microfinance pioneer Professor Mohamed Yunus came together to develop a framework for collective action. So they established a financial <coughs> sector commission on modern slavery and human trafficking, which included experts from, from all over the world. Following global consultation, they, they did one in Australia too, the blueprint for mobilising finance against slavery and trafficking was launched in um, 2019, I think it was in about September. Notably, the blueprint uh, acknowledges the finance sector alone cannot solve the problem of modern slavery, but modern slavery will not end without concrete and sustained action from that sector. Um, following the blueprint, we've seen sustained action and focus on the financial sector. 
For example, out of this process came the Investors Against Slavery and Trafficking Asia-Pacific, which is a group of institutional investors with 5.9 trillion. These figures are just so massive, aren't they? Uh, under management, using their voice to influence how um, investing companies address modern slavery risks in, in our region, in the Asia-Pacific region. In late 2020, this group of investors released a statement in which signatories called on Australian investing companies to meet their reporting obligations under the Modern Slavery Act and to go beyond compliance um, with the legislation by what they call pursuing real action to combat modern slavery. What that is <laughs> remains to be seen. But, um, but the work of this, uh, the Lichtenstein Initiative, I think highlights the importance of high-level government commitment, as you said, but also collaboration with industry, union, civil society, and national human rights institutions, and of course, survivors of modern slavery. Thank you, Padma, and I have to say that Walk Free is, is proud to be the Secretariat of the Investors Against Slavery and Trafficking, and if anyone's interested more on this um, investor and finance sector space, you can go to iast.org, which, which shows some of those investors that have already signed on and we're getting more uh, come on board, which again is, is a really important um, uh, part of this puzzle and when we're talking about addressing different sectors. We haven't really delved too much into different sectors so far, but Sally, we have talked a lot about you know, the international framework, uh, different ways in which governments and business are interacting in this space, um, obviously different, different um, instruments, different treaties that, that governments are signing on to and lots of activity for member states. How do you see all of this sort of translating, you know, this sort of multilateral efforts across the world, translating in terms of your work, frontline work on the ground? Is it having an impact? I know you're part of the Commonwealth 8.7 network as yeah. well, so yeah. Yeah. maybe you could share what, what similar organisations to your own are doing in the Commonwealth and whether all of this is having any, any positive impact. Yeah. I think, once again, as we were talking last night as a committee, um, breaking down to regional is where we're at now with the 8.7 because it's been for the last... Since it's only been established just over a year, we've been really working on policy strategy and, and, and the big stuff, getting ready for the Commonwealth Heads of Government and all that stuff, which is way out of my league. But breaking it down now, we're looking at the regional areas. For example, in the Pacific Islands, climate change is a major, major issue that contributes to their slavery. In other, other countries, it's, it's more to do with child labour or it's more to do with forced marriage. Or it's, you know, so we've all got our own unique major causes that cause it. Um, in Australia, unfortunately, it's, it's greed, it's profit. Just using people for labour, so um, so I think, um, and I one of the things that I keep bringing up from my short time that I was networked in in the UK when we, I was doing this work in in um, Europe, is that I liked the way that the UK have a structure where the government might pay the um, Salvation Army as the organisation to run the government's um, funded survivor supports. For us in Australia, it's Red Cross. Um, but I like the fact that they actually roll that funding out to the, the chain from, from rescue through to long-term care. They've got partnered NGOs right through it, whereas we tend to just keep funding. <laughs> I'll keep coming back to funding because that is the biggest area that we're not getting survivor supports, not being funded. All the NGOs like myself are working very hard at it with what little bit we can. It's like running a ship on an oily rag. Um, and then... but. The, the government continues to fund the Red Cross, to be honest. So I think it would be great for us to start to look at ways that we can actually start to split that money out along the chain of what's what's needed. And I think listening to the way other countries are, are helping each other, I think there's, I think we just need to look, get better at looking at the ground services and how we can help fund what's needed. So we we're the only organisation in Australia that does long-term care for example. So the Support for Trafficking Persons program is 60 days. And after that, they're on their own, or what's happening is the Support for Trafficking Persons sends them to us. So it's um, so we're the only long-term care, but we don't get any kind of support. So you know what I mean? So there's a big gap there. Then there's other gaps. There's no identification. There's no task force going out looking for people. Mm. 
you know, so we've got some big gaps that need to be addressed. But I do think awareness raising, the Modern Slavery Act, the businesses, I just think we just, and I'm, that's why I keep getting involved in all these forums where I've got great people like you guys that really are that making the change politically and in education and policy. But on the ground, it's still a big gap before we're starting to see this stuff help us. Yeah. Can I say, and one point on that the distinction between Australia and the UK is that the UK established an anti-slavery commissioner. Mm. And so they have this focal point and focal office where mm. they're sort of targeting, you know, in a coordinated way. So we don't have that in Australia. Um, you know, our act is housed in home affairs and there are a dedicated group of people looking at that. But I think it makes a real difference having that focal point, which the UK has done. And New South Wales has proposed, but we haven't got there yet. Yeah, well, I'm hoping Australia, through its review process of the Modern Slavery Act, uh, does implement a, an anti-slavery commissioner as well. Yeah. I think it's 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 crucial component mm. uh, towards this. Well, please thank uh, our panellists for this this um, uh, interaction on, on this topic. And um, yes, and then we'll continue it with questions. <laughs> Joe, join us. <laughs> Professor Ford. Professor <laughs> Nolan. Takes a while. Takes a while, okay. Sorry. Small room. So, thank you so much, uh, Excellency, and all the panelists. Um, that was really, we could have kept going, Lisa. I thought there's so much more to be squeezed out of this. And one thing that struck me was just the spread of issues from the sort of global multilateralism and the political economy of globalization and market forces right down to pathways of support at the at the at the local level and you start to see the, the nature sorry the nature of this problem in all its 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 span which is in some ways daunting really uh, but really just uh, before I open up for questions just to thank all of you and to recognize that Padma you're about to start a new chapter in life after 11 years at the Human Rights Commission. So I was going to keep quiet about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're not going to keep quiet. We're all going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> um, and I should just say that when I came in this morning and picked up the name tag, I, um, I made a mistake and picked up Professor Justine Nolan's name tag because I've always wanted to be her. <laughs> <laughs> or just be like her. And, um, You're the only person there. <laughs> and, and just to say that, you know, although she's at an inferior in institution, Superior. Uh, she did study, because I have some of my students here today, she did study uh, law here at ANU, so um, you can see. The <laughs> That's where I that. got my bullshit side. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't know if we had any uh, immediate questions um, uh, to raise. I. I suppose I did want to say uh, to the High Commissioner, it's somewhat reassuring for me to, we talk about these issues, but to, to listen to someone who has worked at the, at the top levels of government and has both such a keen sense of all of these bigger picture strategic issues, but such a, a humanity that comes along with it. And that's something, I don't know, for me, re really reassuring to know that there are people like that in government working on these <laughs> sorts of issues. So, uh, Colin has a question. Thanks, Joe. Um, thank you for all the contributions. It's you know, the ramifications of it all are very, very interesting as, as they are disturbing. I'm, I'm really just sitting there as you know, someone now who is not in any kind of leadership position, and I think there are others here who are either students or retirees, or in my case, both. Um, and you sort of, you know, you, you, you're very much becoming aware of this issue. You look at your own wardrobe and you think, me, how many of those clothes come from a supply chain that's affected by modern slavery? What would you say to people like me, like them, in terms of what we can do? Well, you can go to walkfree.org. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might say something. Like <laughs> there is a you section on our website, and it does actually outline a range of things that that we all can do as consumers. I think when it comes to the clothes we wear, we all have smartphones these days, 
Having said that, smart um, electronics are at the top of the list in terms of yeah. products with slavery in them. But there, there is an app, uh, there's a number of apps, but one very good one is called Good On You. The Good On You app, you can just put in the brand of the clothing you're wearing and it will give you a rating, a sustainability rating in terms of human rights and environment on, on the clothes that you're wearing. The other thing you can do is actually go into the store and ask the question about the supply chain of, of, the, of the brand and do they know about the you know, whether the, the workers have a, a, a living wage that, that make the clothes that go all the way through the tiers of, of that supply chain. So it's really about us asking questions, raising awareness ourselves and, uh, you know, not just sort of buying the advertising that, that we've been led along for so long and, yeah, becoming much more informed through, through what's available and some of the other sorts of things that are out there online. I, I agree very much with Lisa, um, except I think that um, I, I agree you should raise questions, but you should also write to companies and raise them online. Because what you're trying to do is this, in a lot of these companies, there's really good sustainability people within their companies, but they face struggles to get support mm -hmm. to make changes within companies. And the more that you have public, that they can point to, say, public care about this, and that does translate in the shops, but not so much. And so, you know, if you're shopping online or if you're following a company online, I'm forever like stalking them saying, lovely jacket, you know, where did it come from? <laughs> um, and then they respond. But that's good for that company because they build up that there's a care. And I guess my other, I mean, the cynic in me says that, yes, all of our decisions are very important. But, you know, if Shell stop, you know, changes its processes around climate change, look at the number of emissions that drop. And so you have to push, we make decisions, but the sort of the, the decisions are particularly at a corporate level, whether it's around, you know, climate or whether it's around consumer issues, that companies change and the world changes. And so we've got to, it shouldn't all be on us. You know, we, as a consumer, we have responsibilities, but companies and governments have more responsibility and we need to push them <coughs> to do that. And mostly by annoying them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a follow-up question to that one. With the transparency progress or process, for businesses and shopping ethically, um, particularly in regards to slavery, how do people with um, access or inequality access issues or low socioeconomic people who don't have access to, say, large amounts of technology to do the research through the apps or can't necessarily afford to shop it through ethical businesses, how is it a, I guess my question is, is it a corporation or is it a government process to push um, accessibility for people who don't have access to combat modern slavery themselves and whether that's because um, their socioeconomic status or that they're part of the system themselves. How does, mm. is it a corporation, is it a business, is it an NGO um, problem to tackle and wh where does those solutions come from? And that's, Bella uh, is obviously steeped in the literature <laughs> uh, because that's, that's one of the issues really with a world of kind of shared responsibilities which sounds so wonderful and sort of inclusive and we talk about the SDGs in that way but one of the downsides of shared responsibilities is that no one actually is primarily responsible. <laughs> well I think that just goes back to Justine's point that it shouldn't be all put on consumers because there are people that that you know are in circumstances where they can only afford the cheap t-shirt um, you know, it, it does come back, I think, being someone who was in government, to governments. Mm. Uh, and, of course, it means government working with, with business. That's why I'm really pleased to see that the Australian Modern Slavery Act is the beginning process of that. And one thing that is unique about our Act is that it's got a publicly available Modern Slavery Register. So anybody, any of us, can look up the Modern Slavery statements of the companies that report to see what their sort of, you know, supply chains look like, what they're doing about it, whether, you know, how they're addressing it and remediating it. Um, ultimately, though, it does, the, the shared responsibility factor does mean that we need more teeth in, in, in our response. And the teeth part, I think, does come back to consumers making noise, but it also comes back to political will and leadership. And that's where... You know, civil society can play a role to push, push politicians to 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 enforce uh, more legislation, or at least you know comply to their own legislation. But it needs to be tackled at, at so many different levels. Um, that's the sort of nature of multilateralism, I suppose. It is about collaborating, coming together. 
a uh, bit of naming and shaming, um, but ultimately putting pressure on each other to ensure we, we lift our game. And, uh, you know, research plays a really, really important role in that because only by measuring the, the size of the problem do we know how to tackle it and how much uh, need, you know, address and funding needs to be applied to it. Um, but ultimately, I really do believe it's the role of governments to step up. And right down at the grassroots level there, <laughs> the circular economy is really taking off for people that are of a lower income. And even the bigger corporates like H&M and that are starting to have recyclable areas in their stores and, and things like that. I used to be a National Biofermise Australia, so I actually understand what it's like to sit as a where you've got um, you know, shareholders and, and people wanting to, you to make profit all the time and put profit over people. Um, what I do with all my training of small businesses now is try and teach them how this Gen Z particularly will all in the future be shopping by their values. I absolutely believe that. We don't want to wait till Gen Z grow up. And, and <laughs> we, it's something like every 27 seconds or something, somebody is in slavery. We just don't have time to wait for this... Um, change that's coming from the bottom up. But we can, as consumers, I know the impact it has on retailers, they know what we have for breakfast. So if we're actually starting to, if they're starting to see people buying ethically, that they're, they're going to look to change their shelving, their spacing. You know, we used to charge suppliers based on what shelf they were on, how much space they would get and everything on their profits. But if we start to get consumers that are putting people ahead, they'll start to move those, prof those lines and those products into places on the shelves that um, their customers are looking for those products. So it's very easy for us to get on the big picture, get really, oh, you know, what's my little bit of changing my shopping and buying the water that's ethical as opposed to the water that's not or whatever. It's very easy for us to think I'm not making any difference, but you are because thanks to marketing today, as you know, Siri hears everything, <laughs> um, Facebook hears everything, uh, retailers know exactly where we're spending our money. Can I just reinforce that point? I mean, yes, there is the big picture, but government must work with business. Yeah. And we are seeing how that is transforming consumer demand in the UK. And this is not just about the effects on British companies, but international companies, businesses looking to sell in to the UK market. Uh, they're equally liable under our legislation. Um, because if you bring stuff in that isn't compliant with where we are, you don't bring it in. And the other point is that this must be a whole of government. It's not just one policy holder, but how you mainstream it across the work of every government department that has a responsibility for some aspect of this. So in the UK, uh, the Home Office or the Home Ministry, my own parent department in terms of what we do internationally and how we work through the multilateral system, but with uh, other governments and like-minded nations, uh, the Department of Work and Pensions for us, uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, our Revenue and Customs Department, uh, our Crown Prosecution Service, um, our Border Force because immigration and legal trafficking is part of that, and of course our National Crime Agency. So it is a shared cross government strategy where the interface between all those different points of connection uh, come into play. So that's a big challenge to have genuine joined up government, uh, whether it's at the grassroots where criminality happens or it's immigration and our borders or it's foreign policy. Well, thank you very much. And uh, first, can I say um, um, what, all, what you're all doing, whether it's in business or in academia or in NGOs or diplomacy or human rights. You're, is this working? Yeah. Um, uh, very commendable. Congratulations. Huge amount of work being done. Um, my, my area is in diplomacy and um, I had the good fortune of being seconded by DFAT to the Commonwealth Secretariat for almost a decade. 
uh, stayed there because I was wanted or needed. Uh, the government won't be able to count probably and not in Canada. But um, um, my, my role there was as director of the political, um, the political division, and my task was related to running the Choggins and following up on the Choggins. So it happened every two years. Uh, we've talked about the communicate. It's so important. And if I just say how this works practically on the ground, it will give you some some um, perhaps guidance or help or something to think about in terms of where you go next because such a lot of good work's being done in terms of the research and the, the propagation of the message, um, um, the activism, uh, it's been absolutely amazing. But several people I've spoken to today and I think have said it yourself, you need to get beyond the words and into the action. And if you're talking about international action and multilateral action, and the work of the Commonwealth in particular. It's the, the, where the, the Commonwealth interfaces with other international organisations. The High Commissioner has mentioned, for example, the ILO, the UN um, agencies, uh, the UN itself. This is where the Commonwealth, as an international institution, has a role to play, and it's done through its secretariat. So when we came out of a chog, and wherever it might be, and I ran four of them uh, while I was there doing this job, the first thing we sit down and do is analyse the, the communique and then charge the different areas of the Secretary to work in furthering this as a conduit between heads of government and member countries and that's the principal work of the Secretary really. And that meant um, proceeding on the basis of the education area, the public affairs area, you know, the propaganda area, the awareness raising uh, through the legal area in providing legal assistance in terms of drafting, training and all that sort of thing at uh, local levels and uh, through the industrial relations area. All of these branches in the Commonwealth Secretariat that interface with ministerial meetings taking place in interface with the UN system, you know, with finance ministers meetings, uh, law ministers' meetings, education ministers' meetings, pursuing the Chogham agenda in these various forums and building up an interface with the major international organisations which themselves can actually pursue these things individually. Because as Lisa just said, it's all up to governments, but not just our government. There are 53 governments involved here, mm -hmm. uh, bringing them to the point where things have been done. Uh, Sonny Rampal, who was the Secretary General in my day said that uh, the Commonwealth can't negotiate for, for the world, but can help the world to negotiate. And right through the apartheid, uh, things like apartheid, law of the sea, all of these major global problems to which the, to which the Commonwealth can contribute uh, are, 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 are done by supporting, by encouraging, by advocating the role of the, of the position of the Commonwealth heads of government. So, I only say, when you think about the next heads of government, and sort of on the back burner now for a while, think about how you want the Commonwealth to phrase its communicate. What are the next practical steps that could be done? Not just the words, uh, not just the aspirations, but the practical things that could be done. But congratulations to you all for doing a marvellous job. I commend the British government for their leadership and the Australian government for what they've done. But there's so much more work to be done. Perhaps it's like apartheid. It will take 40 years to go to get to the real process. I hope not. Thank you. I'm Meredith Ryland from Mindaroo Foundation. A bit of context to the question that I'm going to ask. Um, so I previously studied under and worked for Joe Ford. Um, and I did some research for him. Oops, we are room full of people of studying the sure. um, Did some research for him on the difference between disclosure and transparency um, and the, the movement from a, a purely disclosure act where information is given and how that actually translates to transparent information on what companies are doing on modern slavery uh, and putting that into action, particularly for consumers I'm interested in. Um, and I also worked for Baptist World Aid on their ethical fashion report, where I was charged with looking at a lot of these modern slavery statements and um, many interesting and um, 
quite long sustainability mm. or, or social reports put out by companies and trying to nut through them and find out what are these companies actually doing um, to improve their management systems on modern slavery. So I'm interested um, particularly to a uh, question for Her Excellency <coughs> in is there a conversation occurring at the moment about how we move from having an act where there's a lot of disclosure of information to then sorting that through so that there is transparency for different stakeholders in understanding what companies are doing. I mean, I was paid full time to work for a year uh, and there were many other people in my team to sort through this information to make it usable for consumers so that they could see what's actually going on in their wardrobes and um, which companies are doing better or worse. Uh, and it's a lot of work to, to understand what does a good modern slavery management system look like? What's best practice? What's a lot of fluff and actually not a lot of action? Um, and I'm interested in whether the government has an interest in or a willingness to start translating that information or supporting other organisations to do the same. Good question. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, I don't have the detail, but I know that this is such an important aspect of uh, UK government <coughs> policy that as we review and reflect each year and evolve uh, the things that we need to do. And I do think we are establishing in the UK a very close partnership between government, business and civil society because all those three parts of the equation are fundamental not just to um, address the issue, but actually to have the data um, and the understanding and then how you use that to further improve. And how do we police all of this? Because it's easy to have a law, but if you don't police it and if you don't have the evidence to show that people aren't complying, uh, we can all write beautiful reports. Mm and it's a lot of window dressing, but what is really behind, sorry, to stretch the metaphor, behind the shop window. So I think we are seized of that because these are challenges and questions we're being asked within UK society anyway, because we're pretty activists as a community in the UK to say, we, you know, this is something we welcome, but we want to make sure it has bite and it has traction. So, um, I think that's where we are. Meredith, I think your question can equally be sort of um, pointed to the Australian uh, government too. Um, before we had an act here, Walk Free partnered with the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre in Berlin to create wiki rates, which, um, you know, sort of developed a set of criteria, indicators to assess modern slavery statements from the UK and you know it's it's been a lot of work we've had a lot of interns through walk free that work on wiki rates um, but th this sort of assessment work shouldn't really be left to interns mm -hmm. there should be and I know that Justine has has team at uh, UNSW I'm sure Joe does too here at the ANU that are doing this assessment work but it, it really, you know, I mean, of course, civil society, academia will always do that, that sort of level of research. But that shouldn't be the sort of the only standard that we have. There should be a standard that government applies to its own legislation where it does actually do this assessment work. And that is an oversight, I think, in terms of our act. Um, UK is obviously as well, although it's, going through, it's gone through a review process and... You know, things, things are, have improved out of that. And I'm hoping through our review process, which is due at the beginning of uh, 2022 uh, for the Australian Modern Slavery Act, that perhaps, you know, this, this um, assessment mechanism is built into government's work. Yes. Uh, sorry, if I can pick up the point. Um, as mentioned earlier, we do have an independent uh, Modern Slavery Commissioner. It's currently Dame Sarah Thornton. And I think having someone that can actually scrutinise government, are we delivering on our promise to, mm. is important. And this process of annual review, also in terms of our work internationally, uh, the, the appointment of uh, an envoy who leads on this for us internationally, in addition to whatever government may do. Mm. 
Which is critical, if I may say, to the whole of government idea. It's one thing to say whole of government, but if there is, it goes back to that point, if there's a specific office that is charged with bringing those bits of government together to see what the criminal justice side is doing and what the mm. uh, welfare side is doing, it's, it's highly significant. And hence the advocacy in Australia around having a commission as, as part of the legislation. Mm. So we've got one more question, I think, and then uh, we wrap it up. Hi, um, Chris had a question. How does the Commonwealth see the future of combating modern slavery in Afghanistan post um, troop withdrawal by September? In the current. Sorry, I'm from the Embassy of Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question for the High Commissioner, I think. <laughs> That's a good question. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is not a member of the Commonwealth. So within the Commonwealth family, um, they're not a member. But I think it is a much bigger issue uh, beyond that. That is one for the international community. And we mustn't conflate, if you like, the withdrawal of troops and those kind of assets with the ongoing challenge of Afghanistan or any other developing country that faces huge challenges. Uh, certainly speaking as Britain, uh, if, if I can say such a thing, that we are seized of the need of how our ongoing development assistance continues. And clearly these issues are part of our concerns. I mentioned um, education for girls. I mean, we have seen terrorist attacks on girls' schools in Afghanistan simply because people don't think girls should be educated. But we know that that is fundamental to transformation in a country like Afghanistan or anywhere else, actually. So our bilateral aid program uh, to Afghanistan, how we work again through the multi uh, lateral system. The programs that we support Britain is usually, in any major multilateral aid program, a top three funder, uh, despite the constraint currently on our economy post-COVID. So we will look at our programs, how we act bilaterally, how we uh, work in concert with other uh, multilateral partners uh, to be part of the long-term solution in a country that has been subject to conflict of one form or another, invasion of one form or another, uh, radicalization as we have seen uh, in Afghanistan for, I would say, centuries. Mm. So, you know, whether or not there is a short-term outcome, I am being very honest, I doubt, but we must work for the medium to long-term in Afghanistan. I can add to the High Commissioner's points on that. I think that the international community has a role to play in supporting Afghanistan's political leadership. And one way that can happen is through the Bali process. So the, Afghanistan is part of the Bali process. This year is a Bali process uh, ministerial conference meeting year. Uh, that means Afghanistan's you know, political leader will sit alongside an Afghanistan business leader along with 45 other Bali process countries to talk about the issues of modern slavery. And we need to support Afghanistan's um, seat at the table in, in that regional forum and, and ways at which it can address modern slavery, you know, whether troops are there or not. I mean, I think when we're talking about issues of conflict, you know, Afghanistan's not alone and we all need as an international community to support human rights, uh, atrocities in countries where there is conflict, uh, where there is no conflict like Australia. I mean, it, it, this is universal, right? So I think it's a finding the mechanism to support Afghanistan, uh, particularly if you see it as a, a moment of vulnerability in terms of the troop withdrawal. I think the Bali process is one opportunity that that can happen this year. Can I just add as well, um, we, Australia sits next to Afghanistan in, in um, the UN processes and 
Afghanistan has an amazing human rights commission. Um, uh, really gives you perspective on what you know what we do as a human rights commission compared to what they have to deal with, including loss of staff on a you know uh, almost every year we hear about how many staff they've lost. Um, so supporting them. Um, um, through whatever means you can, if you're in the embassy or you know, if, if getting our governments to support that commission because it truly is a remarkable human rights commission in the region and probably one of the best. So, and doing really good work on the ground. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so this remains for me to thank uh, the panel. Thank you, Lisa, for chairing and for organising and, and co-sponsoring. Mm -hmm.